Good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Wednesday evening Bible study of the Glendale Road Church of Christ. Uh, if you would like to follow along in your Bibles, I'm going to be in the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. So if you know where to find Matthew, find Matthew and hang a left, at your left, and uh, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And I'm going to be in chapter 1, the first five verses, so you can follow along. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, I don't think God loves me anymore, or I don't think that God has ever loved me? Sometimes I think it's easy to feel that way based on the circumstances we face in life. Maybe because of everything that's happening, we think, well, God must be upset. He must be mad at me. He must not love me anymore. And so on and on we go, and that can actually lead to a bit of despair. And unfortunately, when we feel that way, that despair can turn to anger, and sometimes it can turn to acting out in ways that we shouldn't. This is exactly what the book of Malachi addresses, as a matter of fact. God is addressing his people who believed that he no longer loved them, and so this is exactly the premise he begins with. Now, to give you some background of the book of Malachi, just so it makes sense, about a hundred years have passed since the first Jews returned to Jerusalem from exile. The temple had been rebuilt, the walls of the city had been rebuilt, and Nehemiah the governor had led a restoration of God's people that you can read about in Nehemiah chapters 8, 9, and 10. Since that time, the ministry of the temple and the priests and the Levites had grown lax, as well as the nation whole. No longer was the zeal of God's people alive with regard to their worship, but they had allowed their worship to become routine. Sound familiar? Sometimes it's easy for what we do in worship to become routine to our hearts and our minds, and if we allow that to happen, we begin to regard it as such. And when we regard it as such, we're not fully invested with our hearts, but rather we're just going through the motions. And so God's people had become sort of like this with regard to the temple. And the sad thing was the reason they became this way is because they remember all the prophecies of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Amos, uh, Hosea, and various other of the prophets. And now that they were back in Jerusalem, back in the promised land, they thought, okay, temple's rebuilt, walls of the city are rebuilt, things are up and going again, so God will fulfill all his promises now. But see, that wasn't the Lord's plan. You see, God's timing is often not our timing. And one of the most difficult things for us to do as people of faith is to wait on the Lord's own good time. We become impatient. We want what we want yesterday. But God's promises may be made to us, but they may be some distant time off. And that's what's difficult for us to grasp. And this was something that obviously the Israelites didn't quite understand. And so because they aren't seeing the fulfillment of all of God's promises and the prophecies uh, that were told them by the prophets, they have become discouraged. And they have begun to think, God doesn't love me. And that led to and was reflected in how they disdained the worship of God. And so when you read Malachi, the opening verses begin by addressing the root of the issue. The root of the issue was they didn't believe that God loved them, and throughout the rest of the book, God addresses their behavior. But he has to start with the heart of the problem. And so in Malachi 1, verses 1 through 3, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say... In what way have you loved us? And so the answer to that is, was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste to his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Now, if you remember the foundational story of Israel, you remember there were these twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's name was later changed to Israel because he wrestled with the angel of the Lord and God chose Jacob to fulfill his promise to Abraham. 
Jacob and Esau were the son of Isaac, Isaac the son of Abraham, and God had made the promise to Abraham, and he reaffirmed that promise to Isaac and then to Isaac's son Jacob. But Esau would be the son that God would reject. Now the name Malachi, the name of the book, means my angel. So some people believe that uh, uh, it was a particular messenger and that Malachi was like a nickname more so than an actual person. But regardless of, of who the author was, if the author, uh, if Malachi is a nickname of someone else, uh, or if Malachi was himself just an actual person, uh, it, it doesn't matter much when you consider this. So, but what God sets before them as the Jews and descendants of Jacob, he says, look, if you go back to the foundation of the nation as a whole, I loved and chose Jacob and I hated Esau. And we see why God chose to hate Esau, because the Edomites, who were the descendants of, Eva, of Esau, very harshly with the Israelites. They didn't allow Israel to pass through their land as they left the land of bondage in Egypt. They would later oppose the kings of Israel herself. Then they would come up against Israel to wage war. And after, as the exile was occurring, they took those who were fleeing and they made them slaves and even encouraged the destruction of Jerusalem. If you were to read the minor prophet Obadiah, you would receive a lot more insight into how harsh the Edomites dealt with Israel. But, but this gives a little bit more of perspective on why God says he hated Esau, but he loved Jacob. Now, where the Edomites lived was in the region of Seir, S-I-E-R. And this was a region we read in Genesis 36, verse 8, where Esau planted himself. This is where he lived and his descendants after him. But God promised to ruin them as he had ruined Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read about this promise in Jeremiah 49, verses 17 and 18. So God is equating the wickedness of Edom with Sodom and Gomorrah. And when those of us who know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah realize how the Lord rained fire down on those cities because of their sin, we understand that if you've gone that far out in sinning, that God treats you as them, you've really, really messed up. But the region of Seir was very mountainous, and it was quite easy to fortify and defend oneself from within the clefts of the mountains which the Edomites often did. But when Edom crossed God, there's no terrain so great that the Lord could not penetrate to destroy his enemies. And so in verses four and five, God says, even though Edom has said, we've been impoverished, but we will return and build, rebuild the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I'll throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes will see Israel, but when Edom cross, uh, excuse me, your eyes shall see and you shall say the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. Now, if you study history, Edom often tried to rebuild, but history also records that God did as he said that he would. Uh, for example, the book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 5, verses 64 and 65, which is one of the apocryphal books, uh, details how they tried to rebuild, but God tore them asunder. Josephus, the Jewish historian, in his Antiquities of the Jews, book 13, chapter 9, verse 1, uh, records the tearing down of these people and their land. So it was rather futile for them to try to go against the grain of what God wanted to do. So when you look at this as a whole, God gives several pieces of evidence to a people who thought that they no longer loved him that he in fact did. And here are the three parts. First of all, God said that he loved them. Now sometimes we say, well, words are cheap, but in the case of when God actually says it, uh, it means something more so than when humans actually say it. So number one, God said that he loved them. Number two, he demonstrated his electing grace. He chose Jacob. He rejected Esau. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Yet Jacob I have loved. And number three, the protection he promised to Israel. They may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the people against whom the Lord will have 
indignation forever. So if you're one of the people who, because of whatever circumstances of life you face, you think, well, God doesn't love me anymore. I think God would remind you that he has said, yes, that he does love all humanity. For God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not only does he say it in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but he also points us back to the cross and he says, this is the demonstration of the love that I have for you. You see, if we say actions speak louder than words, God asks the question in return, what action can speak louder than the offering of my own beloved son for you? You see, there's no action that can say such. But yet, sometimes that's what we often do. You may say, God doesn't love me, but God says, I loved you so much that I gave my son for you. You may say, God can't forgive me, but God would remind you that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. You may say, I don't see God in my life at all, but God would say, come to me and I will give you rest. There was a mother walking by her little daughter drawing and as she passed by her, she said to her daughter, she said, I love you. And her daughter kept doodling and drawing and coloring. She said, I know. That's what children do. Uh, but in that moment, love had been taken for granted. And when Christ cried words of being forsaken by his father, God was saying that he loves us enough even to turn away from his son. And so in that solemn act, the agonizing cries of the Savior, God is saying to you and to me, I love you. And too often we answer as that little girl, we say, I know. We don't reciprocate the love to God that he has given to us. And the sadness of life flows from the attitude of indifference towards God. We must come to the point of loving God because we read in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Never forget, never deny that you are loved by God.